Welcome to lecture 28. We were discussing the stress strain behavior under direct shear test. Please remember it's not a very good test but it's useful for sands because drainage is not a problem. Granular material like sands and gravels and we also use it for fields. Suppose we are building an embankment for a road or a railway line, this is all compacted. So, when you get the material from somewhere and most of the time you expect it to be above the water table, drainage is not a problem. So, this is called a compacted fill. Similarly, if you have a retaining wall, we may fill it here and this is all compacted we can use the direct shear test get to get C and phi. And the soils generally are granular, but you can have granular material with fines. That means fines contents can be 10, 15, 20 percent, etc. We also use this test, but not with any confidence for road subgrades. I have the bearing coat then a bituminous concrete, then macadam, then the granular sub-base and then of course original sub-base. So what we do is we remove the top, this is hardly say 500 to 700 millimeters, remove the top soil, recompact it, then we would like to know what is the strength. So after you determine the maximum ride density and optimum moisture content, we can put a sample in direct shear test, get its C and phi. But please do not use direct shear test for dams. What I mean is at the dams, because in case of an at the dam, we'll have the water level here and this part may be saturated. So we need to make sure what are the drainage conditions, is it fully saturated, partly saturated, etc. Direct shear test not applicable for at the dams. But it's good for all our infrastructure projects, embankment for highways, railways, etc. Backfill behind retaining walls and occasionally as a base material. What we like to do would be to conduct shear uh, triaxial shear test and the behavior is also very similar except the stress conditions are different. So, suppose I do a drain test, it does not matter, I can say a dense soil, coarse grain soil or over consolidated fine grain soil and the other extreme would be loose coarse grain soil and look at the normally consolidated fine grain soil. The behaviors are similar in terms of stress strain conditions. So, if I do now plot epsilon 1 versus sigma 1 minus sigma 3, I can get a curve of this kind and what you will find is that here you will have a clear maximum value. Whereas here sigma 1 minus sigma 3 shall we say ultimate and this is for a dense soil or over consolidated soil. Whereas this is a loose soil, loose sand or a normally consolidated soil even under triaxial condition, which means now I am looking at, so I am now looking at when you are applying the deviatrix stress, how does the sample behave. We do at three levels of confining stress, so if you plot under drain test, you will find as you increase the confining stress, the slope increases as well also the peak value. Similarly, this is for a loose sand 
or a normally consolidated soil. If I plot similar graphs for over consolidated soil or dense sand, you get a very similar pattern, but obviously initial slope as well also the maximum value they keep increasing. And then they also asymptotically reach and as I said no matter how you start you find that at large strains all of them will be at nearly the same void ratio. So if I just give you instead of say uh, corresponding to this let us say I am plotting epsilon 1 in the triaxial case I will say volumetric strain. That means here I find out how much volume change is happening. So if I know the amount of volume change I can calculate the volumetric strain and I will find that in case of loose sands you will have volume decrease whereas in case of dense sands you have volume increase. So this is negative. So vol volume is increasing, volume is decreasing. So this is the interesting part I told you. It is the effect of dilation. In case of sands you have been able to visualize that the particles initially will roll in into valleys and then during shear some particles will be rolling in, some are climbing up. Whereas in case of dense sands, again the particles will initially try to roll up, so the volume is increasing. After a certain stage they reach an equilibrium in which case the amount of volume increase is equal to the amount of volume decrease and you will end up getting the constant volume condition. If you now plot in terms of void ratio, let us say I am plotting E versus a string. I have a loose soil, so E is 0.85. I have a dense soil, void ratio is 0 0.45. Loose soil will decrease in void ratio and reach this whereas a dense soil will increase in volume which means void ratio increases and at large strains both of them reach the same E critical that is called the critical void ratio. It is a very interesting unique phenomenon in case of soils that you, no matter what is the initial void ratio at large strains you find that the void ratio becomes the same. But in order to reach that a dense sand will have to dilate to reach the critical void ratio whereas a loose soil will compress to reach that void ratio. So this E critical is defined for each of the type of soils. E critical would be function of again gradation angularity etc. and the confining stress. You have different confining stresses, you will have different critical void ratios. Now in case of a drain test, we measure strain versus the deviatrix stress so that I get the stress strain curve and if I look at the initial slope, I get the modulus of deformation. So please remember critical void ratio is a very good concept and dilation is the unique feature of soils which are granular. So I want you to remember and this is increase in volume due to shear. And the second concept is critical unique void ratio independent of initial condition. So whether it, we start with a dense soil or a loose soil, finally they attain the same critical void ratio. This is E critical. Because of dilation, the we should not use the word phi prime, its correct term would be angular shearing resistance 
which is equal to phi due to friction plus delta phi due to volume change. Sometimes we call it as energy correction. In the literature, people use these two to be similar. This is actually friction angle. When you are sharing two surfaces, you get friction. But when the volume change is happening, some work is done in order to take care of the volume change. Because of that, you find the angle of sharing resistance is higher than the friction angle. For silica grains, phi f is approximately around 27 degrees. Whereas, the angle of shearing resistance is anywhere from 30 to 40, 45 degrees. This is for a loose, poorly graded, rounded sand. This is for a dense angular gravel. So, the angle can vary over a large range depending on the gradation, etc. So, please remember always use the term angle of shearing resistance do not call it as friction angle. Unfortunately, many of the books and commonly people call as a friction angle, but it is not friction. When you are shearing it, it has to be a function of friction plus energy required to shear it when the volume is increasing. <coughs> and that contrib contributes to additional shearing resistance. And this will be higher if you compact the soil. So, when I doing with even all our embankments, fields, etc., you want to get a very high friction angle. So, you should be able to compact to optimize moisture content and maximum dry density. And here is another very interesting phenomenon in case of fields. If you densify to gamma d maximum, Suppose I am plotting water content versus gamma d. You have seen that you get a graph of this kind and you get OMC here. And if I plot on the same plot what is the phi value, you will find that you may get in fact maximum phi at OMC minus 1 to 2 percent dry. Suppose the water moisture content is 15 percent. You may get very high density. It does not mean that you will have very high strength. The strength is higher on the left of OMC that is on the dry side of OMC. So, you get maximum shear resistance dry of OMC. But then the problem would be the residual strain strength is very low. You may have very high strength, but when you share it over a large strain, the strength drops off significantly. So, you have to trade off between these two. And when you do this in case of compacted fields, as you increase the water moisture content or water content, you know that you will finally get saturation line or shall we say air voids are 0, 0 percent air voids fine, which means as you go here you get higher degree of saturation. So, we are talking of engineered fields are compacted soils. The other interesting thing is if I plot tau versus sigma the stress strain curve becomes nonlinear in the sense under if you look at the sample here a compacted soil is never saturated so the degree of saturation is less than 100 percent under low confining pressures the air gets compressed and so the it's purely frictional as you increase sigma 3 the volume is decreasing and the air gets compressed and degree of saturation tends to 100 percent. Once the degree of saturation becomes 100 percent, you will find that 
it behaves like an undrinks behavior and then you will get simply Cu with phi u is equal to 0. Whereas here you may get phi. And of course it's not effective stresses because we are not measuring pore pressures. So in case of compacted soils, when you do the triaxial test, you had to plot the shear stress versus the normal stress and you find the more column envelope to be nonlinear and depending on the stress level you are using, initially low stress level, it will be friction angle and at a different stress level, you may have certain cohesion and friction and at very high confining stresses, you will purely have cohesion and no friction. So please remember in case of compacted soils, low sigma 3, low C, high angular shearing resistance, medium confining stress, medium C intercept and medium angular shearing resistance. Under high confining stresses, you will have high cohesion intercept and phi may be 0 or very small value, a very low. So if I am designing a dam or an embankment, particularly if I have a very high one, let's say you are having a 50 meter high embankment dam or the confining stresses here are low, they are medium and very high here. So when you are checking the stability, I had to use different friction angles or you had to take a weighted average in order to determine the stability. So this you find C and phi are functions of confining stress. Low confining stresses predominantly frictional with low cohesion intercept, intermediate confining stress both cohesion and friction are intermediate. Instead of friction, I should say shearing resistance. And at very high confining stresses, the soil gets compressed and the air may get dissolved into water and then the degree of saturation tends to close to 100 percent, in which case B tends to 1 and B is equal to 1, the behavior is more like an undrained test. So please remember this special characteristic for com uh, compacted soils. Then let's look at the stress strain curves. As I said, so if I take the slope, I call it as E. Again from mechanics, people use the word elastic modulus or Young's modulus. This is not correct because soils are not elastic or inelastic. Suppose you load and then you unload, soil comes back here. When you reload, it goes back here. And you can see the slope here, EI, is different from E unloading because of that the proper term would be E is called deformation modulus or shall we say modulus of deformation. You know steel, metals and even concrete to a large extent they are closer to elasticity. Metals are all elastic at working stresses. Concrete also under more normal working stresses is elastic. But soils are not so we have to determine the modulus. We have different terms for this. Suppose I have the stress strain curve. Let's look at a simple one. This is called, if I draw the tangent, initial modulus at epsilon 1 close to 0. If I want an average, suppose this is our maximum. Suppose I am trying to find out at 0.5 times sigma 1 minus sigma 3 maximum. I can draw a tangent modulus ET 
is called the tangent modulus, but this tangent modulus is varying. Initially, it is very high as you increase the strain, it becomes smaller and by the time one reaches the failure state, this is the parallel to the strain axis which means E t is 0. So, if I want to find out the average, what I do is we join this point to the origin and this is called secant modulus. So, in order to reach from this state to any stress level, if I know the strain corresponding to that particular stress strain, this is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 and this is epsilon 1. So, E is equal to divided by the corresponding strain. So, this should be our secant modulus. If you are trying to determine the settlements or deformations of soils, we need to work out in terms of this average value. Otherwise, we keep changing the slope and incrementally find out what is the tangent modulus, which will be a very tedious process and unless you have a very good software, you may not be able to express this conveniently. So, I will have one value, another value, third value, fourth value etcetera. E i then say some E 1, E 2 and for each stress range I had to find out what will be the value of modulus. So, the best would be to determine the secant modulus. Another form in which we try to fit is if you say what is called as a hyperbola. If I have a graph where y versus x increases and asymptotically reaches, then the equation of a hyperbola you would have probably studied in your coordinate geometry. y is equal to x by a plus b x, where a and b are constants. So, similar to that you can easily fit in a graph sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is equal to epsilon 1 minus a plus b into epsilon 1, where a and b can be easily found out, but that again I leave it to the next level of course where you need to do that. Now, coming back to our stress strain curves, for dense science, the graph goes something like this and you find that it is fairly linear except near the peak value. So, you find that the soil is dense soils, dense sands and over consolidated soils are relatively stiff, which means E i or E modulus of deformation is also high compared to loose sands or normally consolidated soils. Not only is their strength high, you find that the modulus is also high, which means when I apply a load, the compression will be smaller because strain is equal to stress by E. So, if E is high, the strain will be less and that is why you should always compact to maximum possible state or if I have sands, try to get densest possible one. That is the requirement as a good geotechnical engineer, you will find that this is necessary. So, you will find that the E values are the highest and then you will find volume increasing. Now, here if I plot the volume change in fractional case also, epsilon V this is axial strain and volumetric strain, this is for loose and this is for dense. So, as you increase the density, you will find that the curves go gradually. From the loosest to densest, you will find volume decrease and volume increase. Volume increase you can visualize in case of sands. How do we explain the same in case of clays? clays 
or fine grained soil, you have seen that they consist of plate like particles. So, when I am consolidating initially all the particles may be random or as we sometimes call flocculated or random. Now, if you apply a vertical stress, these particles will try to align parallel to each other. Some may be of course, random. You will get more of parallel arrangement. So, when a soil is heavily over consolidated, there will be more parallel arrangement. And now, if you try to shear, these particles will again try to rotate and in the process the volume increases. So, what you find here is like in sands, when the grains roll over each other, in case of clays, the particles may spread out from each other and you get dilation. So, dense soils behave similar to over consolidated soils. In dense soils, the particles are ro rolling over e each other, rolling up. Here, the clay plate like particles are trying to open up and then water may go inside or volume will increase to get you dilation. In case of soft soils, normally consolidated, the particles are trying to come together, so you have volume decrease. So, as far as the drain tests are concerned, this is how the behavior would be. If you do a CU test, that is consolidated and drain test, the stress strain behavior is identical. Please remember, we are plotting sigma 1 minus sigma 3, which means the pore pressure effect is cancelled. The difference between principal stresses is independent of pore pressure. So, you will get again graphs of this kind for loose or normally consolidated soils and this is for dense or over consolidated soil. So, as far as the stress strain behavior is concerned, drain is very similar to consolidated undrained test. But then I would like you to note one other thing. When you are doing this test, you are also measuring pore pressure. When you are doing consolidated undrained test, please remember that in the sample, we have now closed the wall. So, when you apply the deviatoric stress, water has no chance to escape. So, it will try to build a pore pressure and what you find here is, here is epsilon 1 and you will find pore pressures are positive in case of, I'm sorry, normally consolidated soils and loose saturated sand. So, the pore pressure is increasing, which means when I plot or calculate, now I will say sigma 1 is equal to sigma 3 plus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 and effective vertical stress is sigma 1 prime is sigma 1 minus pore pressure. What about sigma 3? This is the confining pressure and sigma 3 prime is equal to sigma 3 minus u. So, what you find here is a very interesting phenomena. As the stress is increasing, the deviatoric stress is increasing, the stress path curves back. I would like to go back to our P Q diagram. This is our failure line. So, if I am increasing, this is the total stress path, whereas the effective stress path would be. So, the strength we get in a CU test is less than the strength you get in the drain test. In the drain test, the effective and total stress are same. So, uh, this will go up to the failure line and you will get a very high Q max from drain test. 
from un consolidated undrained test. Why is this going back? Look at this sigma 3 prime. Confining pressure minus pore pressure generated during the deviatrix stress application. We said that pore pressure is equal to B into A, the increase in the deviatrix stress. In a saturated soil, B is equal to 1, so that's not a problem for us. A is always less than 1, but you may have some value 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.3, etc. You do get a pore pressure. If pore pressure is building up, the confining stress is there, but pore pressure reduces the effective confining stress. So the stress path in the CU test, this is the effective stress path in the CU test. So the strength we get will be less, but if you are measuring with respect to effective stresses, it still is on the failure line. So as far as the phi is concerned, the shear, angle of shear resistance is the same, but the strength, that is the maximum value we get, this is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 maximum will be less than what you get from a drain test. So please remember strength from CU test is less than strength from drain test. Whereas phi may be the same. The shearing resistance is the same, but the stress level reached will be different. Now what happens when the soil is over consolidated or dense saturated sand? In that case, you will get negative pore pressures. So if I am plotting now, pore pressure versus strain, you will get a negative pore pressure. This is positive. How does this happen? It's a very interesting phenomenon. Please remember, you are looking at CU test. In the first part, when you applied sigma 3, you have allowed the soil to consolidate. But in the second part, the soil is undrained. You are not allowing any water either to go out of the sample or to come inside. So here I have these soil particles in a dense state. They want to move up during shear because a dense soil and you are shearing it. It has a tendency to increase in volume. But can it increase in volume? The soil particle volume is the same. It has no possibility of water coming inside because the sample is sealed. We have closed the wall. So the water goes into negative pore pressure. And so what you get is a negative pore pressure and in plot the stress path, you will find that the effective stress is more than the total stress. You have relatively very high strength and that is why we get in the over consolidated soil, you have a higher strength. This is normally consolidated whereas this is over consolidated. Sigma prime is sigma minus u. If u is negative, this becomes sigma minus minus u. So it becomes, if I am adding without the sign, that means I have taken absolute values, you find that the effective stresses are high. So you will find the strength of over consolidated or dense soils in CU test is greater than strength with pore pressure dissipation. Because the pore pressure is negative, you get an apparent higher strength. This is very easily or interestingly demonstrated. If I make a cut in a Himalayas, initially the stresses are unloaded and the soil goes into the negative state and because of the negative pore pressure, strength is high and you get a very high st stability. But after year or two or when there is a rainfall coming, the pore pressure becomes zero and the slope starts failing. 
So that is the problem we find. Suddenly a failure occurs because of either rain or over a period of time. So what you find in this stress strain behavior is that dense sands and over consolidated soils exhibit negative pore pressure in the short term. But in the long term, the negative pore pressure tends to become zero, which means it is increasing because negative to zero is increasing and the soil may lose strength. So you may suddenly find thinking that what is initial is good and safe, which is not true. So please remember in case of soils, we have to worry about the initial state, the time to failure and post uh, maximum stress over a period of time. If the pore pressures are changing, the strength values can change. 